Hi, my name is Cameron, and I don't just read comics. I love them. On today's episode of Cameron Reads Comics, we dive into the first book of Saga. This episode is the first of a three-episode series on the Image Comics series Saga, written by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. This week, we are going over Saga Book 1, which includes Saga issues number 1 through 18. If you're following in the trade paperbacks, this is going to be the first three trades. Saga is the story of Hazel, a child born to the star-crossed parents from opposite sides of a never-ending galactic war. Now, Hazel's fugitive family must risk everything to find a peaceful future in a harsh universe that values destruction over creation. Fantasy and science fiction are wed like never before in a sexy, subversive drama for adults that Entertainment Weekly called the kind of comic you get when truly talented superstar creators are given the freedom to produce their dream book. A warning for our younger viewers and our parents of younger viewers, just so you know, Saga is it, by all means a rated R series. So the language is going to be explicit and also the imagery is going to be explicit in this book. I do not recommend reading this unless you are of the age 17 or older. So you have been warned. I am giving you your spoiler warning for Saga. If you have not read this series, we talk about major spoilers in our readings. So you have been warned. Now, here is a quick summary of what happened. The series leads Alana and Marco are two lovers from different worlds whose people are at war with one another. Alana comes from the technologically advanced landfall, the largest planet in the galaxy. Her people have wings on their backs. Marco is from Wreath, landfall's only satellite moon whose people wield magic and have horns on their heads. As landfall and Wreath were planets at war, Alana and Marco met when she was assigned to guard him in a prison on the planet Cleave after he became a prisoner of war. They escaped together 12 hours after the meeting, bonding over the written works of author D. Oswald Heist. They became fugitives on the lamb. Alana gives birth to their daughter Hazel, the first child with both horns and wings, who occasionally narrates the series. Alana and Marco are, are pursued by members of both of their planets, the Reethers and the Landfallians, because of the perceived betrayal of the two fugitives. On Landfall, Prince Robot IV is assigned by his father to capture Hazel, as well as a counterpart from Wreath, a mercenary named the Will with his companion Lion Cat. After a run-in with a freelance bounty hunter and the Will's girlfriend, the Stock, Marco is left incredibly injured. In order to save his life, the ghost of a dead girl named Isabel is bonded to Hazel and the four of them escape Cleave before being joined by Marco's parents, Bar and Clara. Marco's ex fiance from before his time in war, Gwendolyn, joins the Will's hunt, as does a six-year-old sex slave rescued by the Will and Gwendolyn, who takes the name Sophie. The family later takes refuge at the home of writer D. Oswald Heist, where they first come into contact with Prince Robot IV and Gwendolyn. By the end of the story, Hazel has begun to walk. Welcome to episode two of Cameron Reads Comics. I'm Cameron, and I read comics. Today, I'm here with my friend Russell Gardner, and we're talking Saga Book One. So this is an image comic series by Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples. The way we are reading it collected is in the Book One hardcovers. So for all my fans who are reading in other platforms, this is issues number one through 18 of Saga. We will do other episodes containing... Uh, the rest of the series up till issue 54, which at the time of this recording is the last issue in the current series. So there you have it with Frank Vaughn and Fiona Staples. And on another note, hi, Russell. Hey, how's it going? I am doing so well. Russell helped me with my sound quality people. So if you listen to my first episode, this sounds better, hopefully for you. Russell, let's just get into it. 
how was Saga this time through? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I have a very, I think, unique relationship with this book because this was the first kind of comic book that I've ever really read, right? Like, this was your first recommendation to me. You lent me your copy of Saga Book One. Let's talk, tell tell the listeners about it because this, this, Russell, I don't know if you know, but the entire goal of this podcast is about sharing comics with people. And so Russell, like my last guest, Kyle, is I think the second person who came to me and was like, I think I want to get into comics. Let's like, and I was like, Russell, uh, begging Russell, will you let me loan you something? And yeah, that, I think that was more of it. It was less of me saying, Cameron, let me get into comics and more of you saying, Russell, you need to get into <laughs> comics. I think that was uh, maybe closer to how it started. I don't know. I think history is <laughs> Yeah. There was... No, I'm beg. Like, you guys know, I beg people to read comics. And I want, I knew, well, because Russell, like, let's even go to our relationship a little bit. Like, we frequently will just go get coffee and talk comics or literature or story plot. Like, so I I feel sharing this medium that I feel has all of those things to someone who I guess is just new to it is I think you are one of the better people to initiate into this platform. Right. Well, I definitely felt like with this book, I felt understood in that because I remember we had even talked about how comics felt very, um, it felt hard to get into because with every story, it's like I need to know 37 different stories that already happened yeah. for the story to make sense if it's like Superman or something, you know. And so with this, I remember like the selling point, one of your selling points was, well, this is just a brand new story. You don't need to know anything because it's starting at the beginning. Um, and so that was one thing that was really nice. Uh, and then also I think just because, yeah, we had um, previous conversations about kind of different stories that we liked and what we liked about them, um, that you were always, Brian K. Vaughn was always the person you're like, Russell, you need to read Brian yes. K. Vaughn. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is at all. But now it's like, <laughs> uh, I'm removed from that to the point where Brian K. Vaughn's like, what are the only people that I like, I want to read all of it, you yeah. know? And yeah. so, um, and, and this was really what started it. Yeah. And that's, you know, when it comes to like, Getting people onto my indie comics, I think this is actually – if you want to break someone into the world of comics, it while we do have Marvel and DC, I think indies are some of the best ways to break in because first and foremost, you have you have the ability for your story to end, which is not something you always get because you know one of the main critiques on DC, Marvel, Batman, Superman stories is that it's the eternal second act. Therefore, it's – you know, the su Batman will die, Superman will die, and they both have in continuity, so that's maybe a spoiler for 1994 and, like, 2008. But as you've seen in the current monthly issues, they're back. So it's always about, you know, how they're going to, you know, face the threat, come out of it, and then face another threat right back to back because that's monthly comics. But something like an indie book is you get initiated into this character – at issue number one, and then you get to keep going into that. And so that's something that's very special about these stories. And I think for, an, I also think that something like this gives a lot of credibility to new readers too. And even the medium, you know, because I think, and you can attest to this too. When I gave you this book, it, I wasn't, I'm, I'm not preaching. This is men in tights and capes. These are humans with real dilemmas and real stakes. Yeah, I, there's something, I mean, the cover is a boob, like, <laughs> there's something, and like, uh, little Hazel is breastfeeding yeah. on the hardcover book here, Yeah, and there's something even about that, that kind of separates you from, okay, this isn't some superhero with a stoic face that, like, can do no wrong, this is something totally different, and you kind of even get that from the cover in yeah. the experience, Um yeah, and that, and I think that's something that I can remember my first time going through, and even um, I was picking up on more of that this last time reading through this first book of how like how committed you can tell like BKV is to 
um, making everyone not 100% desirable, right? Like there is no one really in the book that I feel like, yeah, they're like a, they're a pure character, you know, Mm. like everyone has stuff that's messed up about them. Everyone has, yeah, their flaws. And I think that that's something that for me is really engaging as I, and I remember that being one thing as I'm reading, even like from the first page, like these people seem like they're sort of messed up or at least at the bare minimum stupid. Uh, And so that like is engaging for me as a story here. Um, And I think was really what like propelled me through a lot of this. And then of course, he's like quite the master at giving you like five different plots at once and keeping you engaged in all of them as the story progresses, you know? And so as that kind of took footing as well. um, Yeah. I think, I think a big part of this story, Oh, actually, I guess what you're saying is, is what brings me to my first question, which is as we share comics and as we share a comic like this, what, what is your pitch for a book like saga? When if you're trying to get someone to read it, or maybe you remember my pitch, because I'm, all I'm saying is apparently it worked. Um, as as you're as you're bringing it to someone's attention, what do you say to get someone to potentially pick the pick this book up? You mm-hmm. know, how do you, what's what's your draw? Yeah, it it's weird. Uh, that's kind of like a very comp like it's a multifaceted question, you know. That is Waffles the super dog on the <laughs> mics. If you heard that, so he may be making more than one appearance because in my house doors have handles and not knobs. So just oh. like that, Whoa. first appearance on of Waffles the super dog on cue yeah so that's that's a good question but it's like sort of multifaceted i feel like because it's hard for me to give a pitch to something that i don't have an ending for yet Mm. but i guess that'd be kind of the same thing if you're like watching a tv show that's like still ongoing you know yeah um i think for me the draw for this uh, in my pitch is that it's a story that is not about anything even close to this world, but that bears so many resemblances to our world and to yeah. our like relationships um, and families, you know, mm-hmm. and I feel like the beauty of this is being able to see how like space odyssey this is, but mm-hmm. then at the same time, how incredibly human it is and um, how all those stories weave together. So for me, like part of it is just the, the deeper meaning that you can see in the characters and their relationships. Uh, And then the other part of it would probably just be that it's like one of those things when you're watching a show. I mean, because that's kind of what it is with the issues. Everything like the the cliffhangers, the like the end of the episode, um, it's engaging. There's something about it that draws you into it. So if there's if you're looking just for the entertainment value, like there's something really special and engaging about this book as well. Yeah, that's and I don't know. I feel all those things about, you know, lots of comics. And so. I think this this book is also so special in the humanity and like I think that's what brings us to Brian K. Vaughn in general too because he is someone that really I don't, and I realized about I think this is my third reading of these eight, first eighteen issues I think that he is someone that just nails humanity so well and his characters are so special so I feel that I feel when you say that because you know. It's a personal story, and and the way I want to sell people comics and just you know introduce my friends to this medium is really like these are while the stakes may be really great, you know, while they need to go maybe experience the person, you know, it while they may create the child that is the bridge to two worlds, it's really just two people that probably shouldn't be together, but are trying to make it work. You know what I mean? And so I think that's something that this nails. And there's so many people that can relate to that. The special moments aren't necessarily like traveling through space and all this stuff. You know, it's really, okay, we are at D. Oswald Heights, Heist's house reading together. And that's a very important moment. Yeah, so one thing when I was reading this through that I was noticing is, um, and I think probably what was along, it was such a welcome um, companion to me alongside my entrance to comics because what's so beautiful about the beginning of this book and how all the characters develop is everyone's strangers, right? Yeah. And so I, I almost felt like for me, I'm a stranger to this medium, but everyone in the story here, they're all strangers. Even Marco and Alana, they are yeah. 
relatively strangers to one another. Oh, and even even you know, eighteen issues into the series, they're still strangers to one another. Right, they're still finding out things about each other that you're like, you probably should know this about the person that you're married to and have a baby with. Yeah. Um, but that was, I think that's what really is a drawn, like it draws you in is, um, you are learning things in real time with the other characters learning things. Yeah. Like you are a stranger alongside, alongside them learning information about the characters and it just is very natural and there's nothing, um, like mechanical about the way he's revealing information to you because everyone's figuring out the information reader included simultaneously. And and on top of that, like I really just applaud both Fiona Staples and Brian Kevon because the way that they the way he writes dialogue and the way that she draws those expressions and the panels kind of in between what's happening is really how you see comics happen and relationships happen, you know, because I think that's what comics are is just, you know, what happens in between the panels. And so they're they're doing very fluid writing and very fluid human or I guess alien interactions that feel human, you know. Right. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, there's something really engaging about that, especially again, kind of going back to um, I I love the whole idea of Marco and Alana have this child, and they really have no idea how to take care of it. Uh, (laughs) and they're kind of, they're clueless, uh, even, so they're strangers even to childbirth. And then when Isabel comes along, she has to literally like tell she's, she looks like she's like a teenager or something and has to guide Alana through like how to burp her baby and stuff like that because Alana's clueless. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was so, uh, kind of funny. One thing that, which I don't know if this was intentional or not, but one thing I was, pondering as i was doing this read through Mm -hmm. is um that their child is named hazel and um i just i have a niece that's like a year old right now who has beautiful eyes and i have a sister who is a pediatric doctor Mm -hmm. uh and is quick to inform me when i'm like wow her eyes are just so beautiful Yes, and we're hoping her. She says yes, and we're hoping that they stay that way Mm -hmm. because infants' eyes usually change color within the first two years. Yeah, and so that was just something else, which I don't know if that's at all intentional or anything. But reading this, it's like, oh, they're clueless to the extent that they named their child after her eye color. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know. Who knows how alien eyes work? But it's like (laughs) maybe her eyes change color, and it's like you guys didn't even know that because you're you don't know too much about this child that you're raising and you didn't even have, you know, obviously you didn't have a hospital or whatever you birthed her in an auto shop. So, yeah. And I think this story too, like does a really great job about like, especially within the, the, the characters that we experience in, in Marco's parents and, um, him being a parent and how they're going to change the way they raise their children, like based on, you know, their interactions so far, like, you know, you see, I think, Going into one of the most important, I guess, really forward in the book, when Marco's father dies, you see, like, he flashes to, when he finds out his father dies, He his memories flash to when Marco was actually learning to ride a bike. Or, it was a bug. But yeah, it's like a grasshopper. <laughs> I'm like, you're so inventive with your world building, Brian Kavon. And so, actually... You, what you find out is that the language blue, which they use on the moon, on the moon, I think, cleave or reef. I get them too confused. Because it's time like too. one's a city and one's a planet, but it's fine. Right. Where he's from, he's a moony. So where he's from, he's learning how to ride a grasshopper with his father. And you find out that the blue language is Esperanta. So if you actually are reading this book for the first time, go look in your Google translate and type it up. I just had mine ready. And so you actually, in that moment hear one of the first most, I'd argue most famous quotes from this series, which is him interacting with his father and saying, I can't do this. I'm I'm about to give up. And his father says, you can do it. You just got to be patient. And then he's Marco says, I'm no good at this. And he says, you, his father most notoriously says, you have to be good before you can be, or you have to be brave before you can be good. 
which is something so beautiful that you see a moment between his, his parents and him that he can actually share with his daughter, which is super special. And, um, it gets, it gets me excited, you know, when I read and I'm like, Oh man, it's super good. You see the dimensions within parenthood being represented in different ways throughout this section of the series. Mm. Well, and I, to think I missed that whole interaction cause it's just, blue talk <laughs> it only it only it only took me like you know my third read through to decide well maybe i'll figure out what they're saying so i didn't even know that was an option i thought it was alien language that looks sort of like spanish that's exactly different. what i it's it's called esperanta that is the language and it's like whoa but just try it out it's pretty neat um because the words sound cool when you read them too so i'm just like wow that's kind of cool yeah i thought he just like because a lot of the words like are Spanish enough to where you can get what they mean yeah. if you really like look into them. But I did not know that that was a whole thing. You learned it. I'm so glad that I was able to teach you something. Um, okay. And my next question is, do you have a favorite character in this series? That's waffles. The super dog. Yeah. My favorite character is probably waffles. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. That's a good question. You know, I was, and I was kind of thinking through that. Um, as I was doing this read through because I or just thought of like things that he would ask and stuff. And so people I was drawn to. Um, and what I was noticing was that I think there are characters that I, there's different, like, like, I don't know if I have a favorite character. There's different things that I really like about certain characters. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, I'd say I'm really drawn to the center, like the central two characters of Alana and Marco. And, I really yeah. like how they are portrayed as characters. Um, so I really like them. But, and there's part of each of them that I hate. And I like that I hate them, you know, because <laughs> it kind of humanizes them. Yeah. Um, so, but I guess to the one non-central character that I, I really like is Isabel. I mm, love Isabel. Really? Yes. She's so rarely in this, too. Yeah, that is kind of true. Um yeah, and I I really don't. Maybe part of it too is it feels she feels safe and trustworthy. Part mm -hmm. of it because you know the Brian K Vaughn really doesn't let you trust even Alana and Marco, right? You have yeah. all this stuff of Marco's history, and you have people saying things like, "Oh, well, if you've heard the things he did, you know, before, like, okay, Marco's done some crazy stuff. Who knows yeah. what that is?" And kind of the same with Alana, right? You even have like. I think one of the Hazel uh, narrations says, like, I don't know how many people my mom killed at least before she yeah. had me. It's like, yeah. whoa, what's happening? Uh, but with Isabel, there's something about her that she's she was a victim. Uh, she wasn't involved in the war. There's there's yeah. something innocent about her. She is. She re you're right. And and I think on top of that, too, it's I like that um, she's bonded to Hazel. And so. There's nothing. She's the one stranger that, because of that action, you can actually trust her off the bat because she has some skin in the game, right? Like she yeah. can't screw you over because she's literally bonded to your child. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's something about that. Just her kind of innocence and purity, and that she's like a victim of tragedy, but still is pretty quick-witted and helpful. Um, that I'm really like drawn to her as a character. Yeah, and the way and. You have to applaud the way that she was bonded to Hazel was actually very special because, like, she didn't she she could have lied like because you know she bonds with Hazel at a time where Marco is about to die and so Alana's looking for a person to trust in this unsafe desert where the stock was like murking fools and um she so she's in danger and so. Her only other choice is to, to, like, merge her newborn child with this ghost spirit thing. And so what you find is that, Isabel, I think you're so right, which is not something a perspective that I had, is someone who's so trustworthy and wants to take care of this child because she has taken care of children before, which is actually not something this child's own mother has done. So, right. She's the most responsible adult, and she's 
not even adult. She's the teenager. She's babysitter. not even alive. Like, <laughs> yeah, so. she's not even alive. Exactly. And so, um, okay. My favorite character though, I want to get into this character so much because I, I realized. Can I guess? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like because I've heard you talk about that one panel with Sophie so often. No, I already know who it is. What am I talking about? It's Lion Cat. What am I talking about? Right? Lion Cat is my favorite, but it's a little different. It's like Lion Cat. Uh, it's more of like an iconic look, it's, image thing. You can't have Lion Cat without this other character. Is it the Will? The Will. Okay. I. Oh my gosh! I think the Will is so. I I pulled out some quotes. I mm. wrote down. Yes. The, tell me about this. Okay, number one, the will is super fascinating already because he's a man with a code. And I think the way that he reflects this code and the way that he goes about his business, you see how clever Vaughn is in his writing, because, especially in the first issue. Because you, for the most part, are caught up in everything that happens and you can see his foreshadowing in the first issue for everything that happens. I think he's a very masterful like pacer and plotter of his writings mm -hmm. because you have someone like the will. And in issue one, he says, what kind of assholes bring kids into worlds like these? Because he's getting hired to scout for Marco and Alana. Right, yeah. And it's like, you know, whatever, two issues later, he has Sophie. Basically he's someone who's like, you know, very violent. You know, if, if anyone is less likely to have a kid along their journey, I think it is the will. And I think, He's also so interesting because he's a man with a code. He's going after his bounty. He's in love with a woman and he wants to be with her, but it's not working out. And then she dies. And so he tries to finish his contract, but he wants to give that up. And then when he goes to Sextillion, the planet right. of orgies, he goes there to try and escape. And then he gets drawn out of his own business when he meets a slave girl and you see his code come into one of the best panels of all time, which is when he smashes Sophie's pimp's head with his bare hands and right. how unjust he finds. Like he can't sleep, you know, the night that he has to leave her because he's not allowed to take her home with him, you know, or like not home, but like take her with him to escape sextillion. And he's like, before I do the rest of my job, I need you to help me rescue this little girl who's like six and a half, who doesn't even have a name. And so. Right. Well, the, and the job is the, he didn't even want to do the job. He only wants to re-engage so he can have the money to buy her out. Right. Buy out the contract. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's so masterfully done. And even to the point where like he wants to, he wants to let himself go. You know what I mean? He wants to. He doesn't want to be lassoed into the world that he's a part of, but he's drawn there so naturally. And so I think his arc, as what you see with him and Sophie is so fascinating because, you know, what could have been a Jason Statham kind of character is a man with a code that he just can't break no matter how bad he wants to. Because obviously, eventually he does go back and rescue Sophie. And then on top of that, he brings her in and, you know, he gives her a name, which is not something to be overlooked, you know? And obviously that's what brings into spoilers what my favorite moment of the entire arguably series is with Sophie and Lion Cat. But um, he, when it comes to Sophie, he all of his guards are down because he just wants her to be safe. Like... There's a great panel in issue number 10 where he's about – he's getting really pissed at Gwendolyn, you know, who mm -hmm. is arguing. And he's like, okay, I'm like, I can't hang hang with you right now. You're pissing me off. He's about to hit her. And Sophie winds – like Sophie comes up behind him. He says, no hitting. That was a rule. And he doesn't even though you know how viscerally and badly he wants to. And so I just think that you see that in that character and it's so special, you know? And so I'm, I'm so drawn to him because I'm like, wow. And then you see what happens when he follows his code to a T, you know? Yeah. And there's, he has probably some of the more redemptive moments. Um, cause there's with that, um, and, and he has to, right. Because he also has some of the, like the He's dark. lowest, yeah, he, even in the sextillion where it's like, it's super messed up. There's like, it's really graphic. And then it's just like, 
this all seems safe. And it's like, whoa, what? Like, you're you're crazy. Uh, but then it leads him to kind of that redemptive moment with Sophie. And there's also the moment where um, they're, like, trying to chase down the tree rocket ship. And then there's a hole blown in their ship and Lion, Lion Cat gets oh. blasted out. And he jumps after Lion Cat, doesn't even care, like, the consequences. Uh, because Lion Cat, like, means more than if he survived without lion cat you know it's and his so, mate yeah and so just seeing the there's a few moments like that that are so well executed because he needs those moments because there's also the the other side yeah. his like dark moments and just his background in general that he's like a freelancer mm -hmm. and his job is to kill people it's like off the bat you're kind of starting at a deficit <laughs> uh and so those redemptive moments are are yeah i agree pretty well done yeah and even going to, like, you know, he has these snippets of character moments that really, you know, you find out so much about who he is in just a few lines of dialogue. Like, I think the one that really set me over to be my – him being my favorite was when – you number one, he names – he's like, okay, you're you're not Slave Girl anymore. Your name is Sophie. And you find out why he named her Sophie because that's the name of his sister. Right. And I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. And he says, you know, he's in his sleep coma after he gets hurt. And he says, Sophie, like, tell Sophie. And his sister comes in. He's like, it's me, Sophie, Billy. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's just gut-wrenching. And I'm like, this man who has experienced so much hurt, really, is now kind of having some peace with his, with his family. That is – those are the kind of – you know, for me, like, those are the kind of moments I live for in, like, really beautiful character arcs and building and, like – you know all the all these other things so that's my long-winded answer of why he's my favorite right yeah it's a good choice i feel like with you i've noted that you love that little there's like those groups going on you love that group with uh sophie and lion cat and the will and gwendolyn <laughs> yeah um well all of them and i think gwendolyn is such an amazing character too i just think the way they do everything with her like sophie sophie you know by so, you know, literally in opposition of her experience is the most innocent, you know what I mean? Which is something that shouldn't work, but totally does, you know, like, and, you know, she, her relationship with Lion Cat is so, Lion Cat's relationship with everyone else and the truths that are revealed about the human condition through Lion Cat is really one, like, so drawn to that character. Because I'm just like, number one, fascinating, fascinating right, yeah. character in general. And then like what comes what comes out of Lion Cat and the truths that are revealed about the world and about cuz you know Lion Cat speaks absolutely about what really truth is and about the human condition about what truth is and that's why I'm like oh my goodness and it's really funny especially in this series when Lion Cat gets stumped wait wait what moment are you talking about that um what what comes to mind is when I guess the first one that comes to mind is when, oh my gosh, what's your girl's name? Isabel. Isabel is in the burning house. Oh yeah, you see, but he, oh, she like scares him though, right? And she's like, You're she scares him. Of the litter. She scares him afterwards, but she's like, the lion cats go by a code, and you have to abide by this code. You weren't allowed to break into this house, and do what you're supposed to be doing, so you broke your code. It was just like I don't know. Right, but I feel like he was kind of going along with that, no? He's going along with Gwendolyn at first, and they charged in. Right, but he has – he she knows the rules of Lion Cat, just like there's yeah. rule – like the Will's moral compass. He follows by his – or she – she a Lion Cat's a her, she, but yeah. how are we supposed to know that? It says she. I think it uses the pronoun one time. <laughs> so there's your one. So obviously it's a she. <laughs> also, in my head, I voice Lion Cat is a British woman when she says lying. It's a fun fact. Also, um, is this is just because you said British? It in your mind is Prince Robot the Fourth? Is he British? That's a really good question. Because in my mind, he is just because of the use of the word bloody. You know who I might say? You know who I might? Actually, here's another question. This is like a secondary question I had. 
who do you, if you were, were to cast this movie, because I think this comic is so cinematic in the way that it is conveyed. If you were to cast a movie, who would play each character? Maybe I should have given you this question earlier. Yeah, that's... I'll give you my picks. But now that you said British, you know who I picture Prince Robot the Fourth as? Don't say Benedict Cumberbatch. No, no, no. <laughs> well, shoot, that'd be sinister, but no. I would do Jude Law. Okay. Because like, I feel like some part of him has to be kind of charming. Because okay. that'll really be what twists like twists the blade. Hmm. That's very interesting. I feel like if I had to, oh, that's that's a good question of the all the. Cause I'll give you some. Prince of my, Robot yeah. the Fourth has to be British. Cause I think like the whole like blood. He says the word bloody and like if They're, you're saying the word bloody, I'm <laughs> saying that in a British accent. Like there's no other way. I mean, obviously. Yeah, and I think just the whole royalty thing. There's supposed to be some sort of parody going on there, or you know, some sort of reference. Um, uh, give me some of yours, yeah, okay. and then I'll, I'll think through these. Because when I first read this, I was like, I I automatically have to cast these characters as actors, and so Marco is Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Okay. Oh, well, Russell doesn't like that apparently. Oh, I I need I I can sort of see that Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Oh no, I can see that. I think yeah. I want someone a little bit more macho than. Joseph Gordon Levitt. I can't help you. Marco's like a pacifist. But he's pretty macho. Did you see the scene where he's like, oh my gosh, you know. When he finally takes out a sword. Well, that, yeah, and he goes freaking hard. But then also when he's a prisoner and he's like, got his shirt off and stuff, it's like, he's, he he's, looks like he's showing off or something. I'm like, damn, Fiona Staples drawing some dreamy <laughs> as well. I'm like, hey man, if it's a good looking dude, and I'm like, I, I can see that. I'm like, good for you, man. And so I can respect a good looking dude. And so, yeah, I suppose. I don't know. Joseph Gordon Levitt like looks the most. You know, here's my crazy one, but I'm like, oh, she'd kill it. Angelina Jolie as the stock. Oh, I could see that. That would make sense. I'm like, some of these just really fit. And for Alana, it's been really hard because, frankly, I'm trying – I'm I'm really, pr- like, proud of BKV and, like, Fiona Staples for actually using a woman of color for Alana. And I'd want to do, like, Zoe Saldana. Okay. But I don't know. I feel like I feel like I, if I thought about it harder, I could find someone better. Right. Personality wise, Alana reminds me a lot of like Anna Kendrick, sort of, because they're like that's interesting. Kind of like sassy and sometimes annoying, and <laughs> <laughs> but there's like definitely the draw there. I don't know. That's that's like impulse. Impulse. You yeah. ask me who should be yeah. Alana, Anna Kendrick, but. I gave Russell, like, who's your favorite character, like, to think over. And now I'm like, okay, but if we are casting yeah, a movie. Yeah, this is a way harder question. <laughs> Note to self, I learn what I ask you ahead of time. <laughs> um, and then the stock. I think The Will would actually be really great by Jason Statham because I want to see his range. Because I know he plays the hardened dude in every movie, like the, like the badass. Right. But I want him – The Will is someone who's also just, like, so soft. And that's why he's – I think that, you know – and I've talked about it extensively. I think that's what needs to be shown in the will. Hmm. Yeah. And Sophie is the little girl from – what's it called? The Florida Project. I don't know if you've seen that. Nope. She's Mooney from The Florida Project. That movie is amazing and that young actress is amazing and I can't go over that movie. Watch it. That's my recommendation for the day. Okay. That's for the listeners and for us. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I I don't think I can even engage with this question beyond my Anna Kendrick. <laughs> <laughs> and that is enough for us. Yeah, because I'm trying to like think of like. <laughs> and you liked Angelina Jolie as the star. I did. That seemed like a pretty good call, because it's like, yeah, I don't know. The stock is. If like, she can pull off Maleficent, I feel like that's it's kind of in the same weird monster range. <laughs> I think she's so. You know, it's a weird, like, it's weird to say about, like, you know, a non-existent character, and maybe this is just another thing this comic does well, but, like, I think, I I find this spider woman, like, so seductive, and so you kind of really understand why, I guess, if, to make a pun, the will is caught in her web, you know? Oh. That was, like, just what came to my head, and I was like, <laughs> well, no pun intended, but I suppose, you know, just own the pun that yeah. was intended. No, you're already, you already committed to it, so here we are. <laughs> Okay, um, here's uh, my next question for you. In this volume, did you have a favorite moment? Yeah, so I feel like I didn't have a favorite moment, but mm-hmm. one thing that was like 
very engaging that I guess throughout, because this is a throughout thing, is the Hazel yeah. narration that's kind of going on in the background. Like there's a few moments that are, I don't know, they like kind of got me and I, I liked. Uh, yeah. Which, by the way, before we get into this, how old do you think Hazel is when she's narrating? I think she's really old. I think Hazel's like, honestly, I I, I really believe in my soul. Like the last issue is going to be Hazel as a grown woman, maybe reading this to her kids. Okay, I can see that. I think if we, I think if we understand anything, it's that Hazel lives through the whole thing. Well, yeah, but you have to ask yourself because she does have the part where she says, "Thanks to these two, I get to grow old." She like says that. It's like, oh. Mm-hmm. But then, part of me, when I'm reading the narration, she feels like she's not old. Old. She feels like she's like, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> not that old, because when she's uh, like narrating. I don't know, like even because one of my favorite little tidbits was when um, Alana, you have the meeting of Alana and Marco for the first time, and like she visits him in, or she, I mean, she's supposed to go make sure he shuts up because he's in his cell and he's like <laughs> being naughty or whatever, and so it, she, he like has this moment of like peace be unto us or something, right, right. and then she just like smacks him in the mouth with the butt end of her gun, <laughs> and she's, she's like no talking. Um, but then right at that moment, it says in romantic comedies, this is called the meat cute. And that's like the Hazel narration. I don't know. Something to me that feels like sort of childish or something, but maybe that's just because she's just kind of, I mean, you, we have yet to see her mature really. So who knows, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah. And it, I think her narrations also kind of give you a window into like how we receive the the stories that our parents tell us as opposed to how they actually happened. Because I, I think you, you have this, and anyway, um, you may know the terms better than I do, but you have this thing with Hazel where you, she's an omnipotent or omniscient narrator, but she's also kind of unreliable because she's saying these things that are super sweet. You know, I was like, Oh man, she, homie is getting tortured in prison, <laughs> prison camp. And, this is the meet cute because my parents love each other. You know what I mean? This is where it all worked out for them. And it's like, ah, uh, it doesn't look like it's working out. So I think it strikes a really natural human chord in that story. Right. Well, yeah. And there's something about, uh, and just the nature of how the story is unfolding that Hazel is very ominous. in a lot of the things she says, you know, oh my gosh. Um, to where you're like, what does that mean? Right. You know, like thanks to these two, I get to grow old. It's like, okay, that's great. But then, um, there's like the whole thing with the will where she says something like, he wasn't the first one to try to track me down and right. kill me or, right. or he was the first one, but he won't be the last. And you're yeah. like, okay, cool. Which is while I love the promises we are being made and that's actually how story works. I'm just like, okay, but who else? Right. <laughs> like, he's, he's good at giving us the payoff though. We're just going to have to he, wait. He while. really is. Um, my favorite moment. And we talked about this a little bit earlier is when, Sophie is in like paradise with the will and Gwendolyn and she is citing the truth about her condition or like she's, she's sitting with lion cat in a garden and she's just kind of saying things about herself that she believes are true. And I think number one, we do this to ourselves all the time as we recite the things that we think are true about ourselves and lion cat, you know, you, you listen to whether or not, lying cat is going to say lying. Right. But what happens is, so she says, my name is Sophie. I'm six and a half years old. I can stand on my leg for a really long time. My favorite color is blue green, which uh, even in these moments, I'm just like, you're seeing so much character already. I want to be a doctor or a dancer when I grow up. And then she says, I'm, I'm all dirty on the inside because I did bad things with, and before she even finishes lying cat interrupts her and says lying. And you see after that, Sophie hugs the cat because I think lying cat reveals. The, and this is why like, you know, eternally I think lying cat is one of my favorite comic book characters of all time, because this is kind of an omniscient truth. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. I didn't want to spoil this moment though, but lying cat reveals the truths that we say about ourselves and tells us whether or not, you know, they're true. So Sophie, like I said, is so innocent. You know, she's she's six and a half years old. And she has had all of these horrible things happen to her. Not that I can 
you know, have any perspective on the things that she has been through or another survivor of those kinds of things has been through. She, she is not dirty because those things have happened. That is not where her value is. You know, she's not dirty on the inside or on the outside. And so lying cat reveals this moment where that's not true. You're a sweet little girl who has been through a terrible time. And it's something as simple as saying one word, you know, about mm -hmm. who someone is and what has happened to them to define who they are. I'm just like, that is so beautiful because Lion Cat is refuting the lies that we say to ourselves all the time. And I'm just like, we have this grounded character that can say one word and it changes everything. Also, I didn't say this earlier. And when I'm casting Lion Cat, the voice that comes to mind is M from the James Bond movies. Not the man, but the woman. Okay. It's like lying. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I don't even know if I have a comment on that I cast. Just... I imagine like a cat sounding voice. <laughs> what about a comment on the other thing? <laughs> yeah, maybe more on that. Like, yeah. Meow, lion. <laughs> yeah. That's... It's like meow, lion. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that is, it's a, that's one of those moments where it's something that is happening in a story that you can tell there's, there's something deeper happening here. Um, yeah, and what I like too is because she's she's still in a lot of ways carrying a lot of the baggage from what she was, like even in the way she's addressing the will. Um, like right before that, literally like a scene before that, it's like a very master oriented, you know, like whatever pleases you, the will or whatever. And yeah. and so you can see that there's a lot like she's like vulnerable. She's been given a new name. There's something there that is maybe giving her a trajectory towards some hope. Um, and, but she's still just this fragile little girl. And so, yeah, it is this, this moment where this cat can reassure her of who in her own doings, according to her own will, like who she is. And she's just a little girl and there's like yeah. nothing that is bad about who she is. Um, yeah. And, and it really sets you up to like Sophie's trajectory is like almost because she's just so young that it's like one you can um, witness alongside Hazel as Hazel is growing up. You also have this girl who's been just the victim of um, just the worst circumstances yeah. beginning to realize the truth, deeper truth about herself um, and maybe start to live in light of that and like have this new family that's just as dysfunctional as hazel's well way more dysfunctional oh actually that's such a good mirror and maybe that's why i'm so drawn to them is because of the like the weird family I, vibe that goes on with them you know i think we can we can both agree that the center of this book is family and i think that it addresses it addresses all types of familial relationships and i think you know the the, the relationships explored in this book are some of the best explorations of relationships because it's all types, you know, Marco's relationships with his parents, his current wife, his ex, his child. And, you know, and I received that, you know, cause I'm a male in a relationship. So for the females who are reading this, maybe it's Alana and the way she relates to all these others, to the in-laws, to the la la la. And so family, and, I, and I'm a full believer of this, but family is what you make it. And so, it's not necessarily by blood. And I think you have a really great representation in that in someone like the whale, you know, while he does have a great relationship with his sister, his relationship with Sophie, and even I think moving forward, his relationship with Gwendolyn and especially, you know, a creature like lion cat who is his mate for all intents. Well, not his mate, but like his companion for all intents of purposes. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, there's definitely, and I mean, and we haven't really even talked about Prince Robot yet, but you have a whole other family dynamic going on there, right? And you have the, my wife is expecting and I need to get back yeah. home to see my family. And so you have, well, yeah, and there's something that I wanted to say, but I know I can't say it yet because it's in the next book. Oh, uh, yeah. But, well, stay tuned. <laughs> but... What is nice is you have also this, so you have all these weird stages, right? Of mm -hmm. family. You have a family that is like a family in a 
we are actually together and we have a child sense. But even then, you're like, ah, oh, you guys, what? Like, you guys don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You have, like, Marco's parents who are maybe the more established familial representatives in terms of relationship. But, of course, that's pretty short-lived here. Yeah. Uh, and then you have, yeah, the Will and Gwendolyn. But they're not together. They They just have the whole... They're both into each other, but they're not together, and they punch each other sometimes. Dynamic going That's on. That's so funny. Uh, and, but then you also have the weird, like, estranged family. I need to get back to my wife. Dynamic with Prince Robot the Fourth. So it's yeah. it's nice. Yeah. No, you're not. You're not wrong, and you're. That's interesting. Prince Robot the Fourth. That's how we should say that, huh? Yeah. Not Prince Robot. Something about me. Ivy. Very like well, Prince Robot Four. Like I don't know. There's something like that's. You're right. More. It's more about British. That? <laughs> uh, it's, no, it's what? <laughs> I'm like, ah, uh, that's as much as I care about the royal family. Is how I pronounce the numbers. But yeah, I just realized that. It's like, oh, it's probably Prince Robot the Fourth. But something about him being a robot, I want it to be just the number Prince Robot Four. You he know, hurt. Prince Robot. Which maybe it is. They, I mean, they just give you the Roman numeral. So who's to say? Well, okay, if you want to dig into Prince Robot, let's dig into him. Like, I think. I think that's actually – I think he is a kind of character that shines in something like an indie comic because he's so sinister. He can be really like just brutal in his portrayals and like – okay, for for example, when he's in D. Oswald Heist's house, the lighthouse, it is scary. And then when you find out that they've been there the whole time, it's even more scary. So – I just think that he is a a really great sinister villain, and that mm. yeah, I love that moment with um, where he's talking to Mister Heist um, because you have like these two contrasting ideologies completely, but, but both have been subject to like immense hardship, you know, because you have the whole uh, what do they call that battle where. Prince Robot the Fourth, all his like companions like died and stuff. It's like Ground Zero or yeah. whatever they called it. I, I forget, but you know what I'm talking about. And yeah. so, but his response to that is like almost he needs to defend the legacy of that hardship he endured, and so it's almost like he's like doubled down to some extent on his service. And then he also has some family component where it's like it's expected of him to do that because yeah. it's part of his royal legacy you know to to be part of this war effort and even and, and even to the point where it's part of his royal legacy but it's also going back to what's expected of him they're they're kind of selling it to him as if your family matters to you if you really want to see your child this will be done faster than it's being done you know what i mean right yeah and and i love that component too because as much as he's probably the villain you're the least on the side of i'd yeah. say you're still sort of on his side. I mean, he has that redemptive aspect of, oh, you've got a kid on the way and you actually, you genuinely like your wife and there's like, you want to see your kid and have a family, you know? And so there's like that part of it that's actually like pretty um, redemptive there. I would say the one villain who's like a very peripheral villain who hasn't had a redemptive quality for me yet has been the one, uh, it like his his boss that he... Prince Robert the Fourth is always really? on the phone with. You're the, right. You're right? not like, wrong. I whoever that guy is with the dark wings, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Actually, great character too. Yeah, but he's the only one who's like, he just seems like he doesn't give a rip, and he's. Yeah, he's like, I'm. You're out of sight. You're out of mind. But also, why aren't you here yet? Yeah. Uh, but he and he's more of a peripheral like character, if anything, yeah. right? Um, Throughout the series. But that's that's what's so um, great about this is everyone who's hunting your main characters. You're not completely against, you know, even the people who are like the villains have some sort of redemptive qualities to them. I mean, the will we've talked about the oh. will and the will with a child. That's part of part of one hunting party yeah. consists of a child who's just been rescued, you know, and, uh, the I'm other one. Think, do Sophie and Hazel, I don't know, maybe it well, definitely be in future volumes, obviously not this one, but do they interact? Cause I'm like, how would they? How would their conversation go between one another? You know. Well, I still haven't read book three. You're we'll get there. Behind. Yeah, and we'll... because I think I I had a whole affair with Why the Last Man, and it really 
I had to stew in it you for know, a while, you know? Yeah. More BKB for the eardrums. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, so I think I really like what you're bringing up about especially the ideology opposition between D.L.'s World Heist and Prince Robot the Fourth because Prince Robot is – and I, I think you're right. I, I agree why he's doubling down. I think every – Brian K. Vaughn does a really great job in in bringing the 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 reasons on why everyone is behaving the way they are to fruition. Like we understand, like D.S. Old Heist's son and wives being lost in the war, you know, in in, in the back backlash of the war. Right. It makes sense for him not to to be a pacifist, you know, and to be writing these books and uh, against war, and so. To see them in opposition, I'm just like, wow. It was it was a very beautiful scene, you know? And so I'm a big fan of the way that that was delivered and the way that... And that they, they understood each other. There was a moment where he's like, what's the opposite of war? And then he, like, actually understands the weird, like, sex fantasy yeah. near-death experience thing of Robot the Fourth. That there's a moment where these people who represent like one's the devout skin in the game army person and then the other's the pacifist they have this moment of mutual understanding there that is like very brief and then everything just hits the fan and it's chaos after that yeah. um but that is that is kind of a nice moment of these two opposites meeting in some central place yeah no i guess you know it makes it makes you think that like maybe they aren't as far apart as they think they are you know and to to be too extreme is more alike than you know to not be so that's a that's a very interesting perspective and and take is there any other characters or moments that stick out to you within all of this um, well, let's see. Who that are we, worth discussing? Yeah. Which characters haven't we really talked about? Here? I think we've talked about Gwendolyn. We haven't or, talked about the reporters, but I feel like they're, they're just starting. They literally just, yeah. like, issue 16, they're like, okay, we're here now. Yeah. You know? Um, Gwendolyn, yeah. And Marco's parents, I'd actually... Re- I, right, that was the two I was thinking. If we haven't talked about anyone, we haven't talked about them, right? Okay, actually, I have a question about Marco's parents, and I'd love to hear your opinion, is when you look at the re... I think it's the men from... Because... She's from Landfall. The men, I think, are from Wreath. I think that's their planet. And so when when you look at Marco and his father, I think both of those men, I think a very special moment is Marco's father's, bar, like, Bar, that's his name, mm-hmm. Bar's relationship with Alana right. and when they're first meeting. And then when you look at Marco's relationship with Alana, too, and who they ended up with, I think the women are, I don't want to step on your toes or but for lack of a better word the women are more like abrasive they're they're kind of head first chargers like stubborn and they will go to battle but the men are so uh, like passive and like loving almost for like they're 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 way more nurturing and because like if you look at Marco, like he is he's the kind of guy who's like, I don't wanna take out my sword ever again. And the arc that he that he went on that I thought was really brilliant. And I mean look at his father, he's like, I just wanna spend time with my granddaughter. You know what I mean? I'm like, look at those beautiful eyes. And it's like, Ugh, I'm crying right now thinking about it. But like I think I think the way that it almost does like a paradigm shift between the the parental roles Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. Right. Yeah, there's Yeah, I'm with you with the bar. I feel like with Marco though, I'm also like a little bit like, oh, but you could snap for sure because of the one like instance where what he's like yeah, yeah. enters protection mode because mm-hmm. Alana gets like her shot in the arm, right? And then yeah. he just like freaking almost murders everyone. Oh, um brutal. And so but but you do see it's almost like he he's going a total 180 of what his what he used to be which was like really it seemed like a and even they give that story of that makes him seem like a zealot even more of when he was a kid his first memory is like seeing the battle that was fought on his homeland and all of his like ancestors that died and 
you can totally get that sense of like he was this zealot but now that he's part of this family he's experienced someone who actually went against the paradigm he was brought up believing in Mm -hmm. um in terms of you know the winged versus moon you know whatever yeah yeah, yeah. uh wreath versus landfall like some now it's almost like he's overcompensated to some extent right like he's like okay i'm just gonna give up my sword now like i realized that that could probably serve some great protective purposes later on but no i'm just gonna throw it away you know yeah oh my gosh yeah i think the way he's willing to sacrifice for his family moving forward and the potential that, that they have as a family is very well done. And it's just such an interesting dynamic explored that we don't necessarily see. And so I also really love, like, I think it is a critique also on 